Hey, Constant Viewer. What's your favourite Stephen King musical? What's that blank look for? You, don't you have one? Oh, honey. Well, if you don't have a favourite Stephen King musical, definitely keep watching. And I'll take a few minutes to tell you how Misery breaks all the rules of horror and emerges triumphant. So I've got to give a spoiler caution here. Even though Misery is a relatively well-known horror film, and there's certainly one scene in particular which is incredibly well known in horror. I may not be going into great depth on the plot details. Uh, I am just trying to focus on all the essential aspects to show how misery breaks the rules of horror. But still, it is going to be somewhat spoilery. So if you would prefer to watch the film completely tabula rasa, unspoiled, then I'd say pause this for now, watch an absolutely amazing horror film, and come back later. And now that I've given that spoiler warning, I can post this. It's for the best. Yeah, I am a terrible person. You know, that wasn't the only reason I wanted to make this, but I'm not denying it played a role. Anyhow, Misery is a well-known success. It is not an obscure horror film. It had a very famous director in Rob Reiner. It was made with major stars such as James Caan. Kathy Bates, uh, Richard Farnsworth, Lauren Bacall, of all people, and it is of course based on a Stephen King novel. There is some serious firepower in this film production. We shouldn't be surprised that it was a success. I mean, heck, Kathy Bates even took the 1990 Oscar for Best Actress. Now, a horror film getting Oscar recognition is already highly atypical, but Misery is far from a typical horror, as you can tell from it being in this series. Now, a horror film getting Oscar recognition is unusual enough, but I think it's really appreciated how atypical Misery is. This film massively breaks the rules of horror, and there's two I'm going to specifically focus on. Now, I've covered this aspect before in my video on Candyman. The heavy use of daylight settings is very unusual in horror films. Because I've covered it before, I'm not going to go into massive detail on it, but I still want to note, again, that it is very unusual to set so much of your horror in daylight. It generally acts against everything you want to do in horror films to get your audience feeling scared and tense. We're traditionally setting horror films in the dark and at night to activate those long-formed evolutionary responses that make us more alert and tense when we can't see a threat clearly. Candyman broke that rule, it worked out amazingly, Misery also issues it and remains effective, but it does that in a very different way to Candy. This is more of an extension or an evolution of the daylight rule. Misery is highly unusual in that it works more with suspense and dread and not surprise. I don't think anyone can explain the difference better than Alfred Hitchcock, no stranger to horror himself. The element of suspense is giving an audience information. Now, you and I are sitting here. Suddenly a bomb goes off. Up we go, blown to smithereens. What have the audience had watching this scene? Five or ten seconds of shock. Now, we do the scene over again. But we tell the audience there's a bomb underneath this table and it's going to go off in five minutes. Now this innocuous conversation about football becomes very potent. They say, don't talk about football, there's a bomb under there. That's what they want to tell us. Then their anxieties will be as long as that clock ticks away. In the case of Misery, Annie is very much the bomb. She's a threat and she's in plain view and we know she is dangerous. And she is slightly unpredictable, but we effectively know the rules of the scenario. We know the countdown. Paul's completion of the novel is effectively the timer that is ticking down here. And the tension is in the form that we know Paul has to keep her happy, but still work towards his escape. And this is part of a dynamic in Misery that makes it work very differently to a lot of horror of the time and, and actually most horror now. I hope you get the difference here. Annie isn't disappearing down side streets like Michael Myers or 
it, she's not lost in the shadows of the woods like Jason. Annie is in the next room. You know she's there. You know the threat is nearby at all times. And that's a very different form of horror. So I need to talk about the dynamics and the mechanics of misery. I think I can do it best by comparing it to contemporary and well-known horror films. If you compare misery to Halloween and Nightmare on Elm Street or Friday the 13th, there's a really obvious difference in that those films generally have a large cast of characters who, to put it crudely, are meaty camouflage for the final girl. Sorry, that's just kind of how those stories work. Now, if you're familiar with those films, you're going to know this dynamic very well. Uh, one by one, a member from that group is effectively picked off. They uh, go off into almost like a separate unit of the film. And in that unit, the dynamic is basically them versus the threat versus Michael, Freddy, Jason. They are trying to escape their fate and they are seldom successful. There is a brief period in which the threat is very near and very obvious and in sight. And in this section of the film, the tension is mounting and mounting and mounting until the threat catches up with them and uh, in academic terms, uh, their story arc is resolved. In short, rinse and repeat until you have your final girl who is then isolated and at her most vulnerable. Uh, I'm not dismissing this, I'm not trying to do it down. That is a different way of building up the tension and scaring the crap out of your audience. But one result of that is that your story is then broken into these small parts, these vignettes, in which the terror mounts for a short time and then is resolved. And the result of this type of storytelling is that your film is broken into these vignettes of uh, these bursts of tension where it goes high for a short time and then is resolved and high again and resolved. These vignettes of uh, a character being threatened, tension rising as they try to escape, and then tension released as they're killed. You know, once they've been killed, you've jumped out of your seat, uh, you've cleared the popcorn out of your lap, and uh, your brain's logged your next week's nightmares. Um, but in a way, you feel better. The tension is released, you know? Now that's rubbish for the character with an axe in their skull, but the tension, the worrying over their fate is over. But in Misery, the dynamic is completely different because there are essentially only two characters for the whole film. Now, in, in, in crude terms, because none of these characters are disposable, the characters matter more. You're more invested in them. It also means that there is no regular release of tension. That just mounts and mounts and mounts. Another result of this is that the story gains an incredibly tight focus. We are really only invested in Paul, and Paul really only has one goal for the whole film. Therefore, that's effectively our goal. We want him to escape. That's the only thing we have to focus on. When Annie flips out and hurts Paul and injures him more, it's staying with him. His goal isn't changing, it's just got even more urgent, and it's even harder for him to achieve. That keeps attention mounting up. The only thing that he wants, that we want on his behalf, just got a lot harder for him to achieve. And that increases attention for us as an audience. When he upsets Annie and she gets angry with him, we're not getting a scene where she kills him off and the tension resets. We're not restarting with a new character at that point. When that famous scene happens, we're sticking with Paul afterwards. We're not resetting the tension. We're, we're still with Paul. We've still got the same goal as him, and it just got a whole lot harder to achieve. In this film, you don't get to breathe a sigh of relief. You're staying tense the whole time. With only two people to focus on, everything matters more. And that emotional investment is what makes the tension stronger and the scares more horrifying. It's a much more mature, more patient form of horror. That change from the roller coaster model of tension and release uh, to an unending constant increase in tension is very much breaking the rules of horror. It's just my taste, but films that use this uh, constant tension model 
films like The Strangers, Inside, Martyrs, uh, Knock Knock, Eden Lake, those all really worked well for me. And um, by work well, I mean they scared the absolute shit. So here's some fun misery trivia to delight your friends and maybe win you a pub quiz. Um, the two character, one location setup of misery made me think of it as basically a play. And I'm far from the first to see this. Misery was adapted as a play as early as 1992 uh, redone in 2005, also 2015, and in Finnish in October 2019. And flashback to the beginning, in 2014, a Dutch composer, Froros van Rooyen, adapted it into a feel-bad musical, according to Wikipedia. At, uh, amazing, Stephen King musical. Still better than the TV version of The Shining, I would bet. Now that 2015 stage adaptation is particularly interesting. It was not a small scale thing. It was on Broadway. It starred Bruce Willis and uh, Screen 2's Laurie Metcalf, which I find pretty awesome. Uh, she even she won an award for her portrayal of Annie Wilkes. It really does seem to be an award magnet, that role. I did try to find more than just the highlight reel promoting the play, but uh, no luck. Anyone knows where to find a recording, please let me know. I would really love to see it. Uh, I'm, I'm rounding things up now and finishing it off, uh, but I just want to elaborate on the play thing a small amount. I don't want this to seem like it's contrary to my view on remakes that I expressed in the last video. The fact that Misery works very well as a play uh, makes it very remakeable. These are challenging character roles and it's a kind of thing where I would happily see it over and over just to see a certain actor's take on the character. You know, I will happily seem like a hypocrite on the remakes thing if I get a whole host of adaptions that let me see, you know, like Olivia Coleman as Annie Wilkes or Monique, Carla Gugino, Michelle Fairley as Annie Wilkes. Um, for the Paul Sheldon role, uh, Alexis Denisov? Anthony Stewart Head, Tom Hardy, James McAvoy. It's kind of fun to play around with the Dreamcast for this. If you already know Misery, I hope I've given you an interesting perspective on it. And if you haven't heard of Misery, I hope that is the next on your watch list. Misery really is an amazing horror film. I, I cannot recommend it enough. I hope you're liking these videos on breaking the rules of horror. Uh, I find it really interesting to try and think of horror films in that way. And my next video is also going to be about a film that breaks the rules of horror and um, it's probably going to get downvoted into oblivion. So that's going to be fun. Whether you agree or disagree with my take on Misery, I'd be really interested to hear from people down below in the comments. And if you like the videos I make, then please do subscribe. This channel is tiny and every new subscriber is a delight. Okay, thanks y'all. Cheers. Durango 95 purred away real horror shows.